Well, good morning, City Light. As Pamela said, my name is Daniel, and uh, I get the joy of serving at uh, a sister church, Providence in Omaha. And uh, it's my joy to be with you guys today and to get to preach this word to you. So with that, uh, I would love to pray to start our time. Heavenly Father, God, you um, are so good to reveal yourself to us, to invite us into relationship with you. God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through him and your word. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would ultimately be glorified, that we would be humbled and that it would lead us to a greater worship of you. Lord, would you uh, help us just to, to sense your spirit in the ways that might be convicting or encouraging us. And Lord, would you speak through your word this morning and would it not return void? Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you guys have been in a series called The Supremacy of Christ as you walk through the book of Colossians. So week in and week out, you guys have been seeing why Christ is supreme over everything. And so I think to start this morning, we need to go back to man answering the question, why is Christ supreme? Well, it all starts at the beginning. You see, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the plants and the living creatures, and then he created man, and it was good. And man was invited to walk with God and and was invited to a relationship with him, but was given just one rule, to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But ultimately, what did we do? We ate from that tree. And because God is perfect, and because God is holy, we were then cast from his presence, because God could not be in the presence of sin. The very thing we were created to do, glorifying him by enjoying him, we could no longer do. And for thousands of years, the people of God were trying to get it right, and they never could. And then they were anxiously awaiting for the coming of the promised one, as we see throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. The one who would ultimately defeat their enemies, not Rome, as many of them would have thought, but no, something much greater than that. And after anxiously awaiting for thousands of years, God sends his son Jesus, who left his throne and came to earth to walk with us, to be a human, to experience trials and temptations, to teach us how to follow God and to ultimately die. To die? Why? Because Jesus, you see, was not sent to overthrow Rome, but was sent to defeat our enemies by laying his life down on a cross in order that the debt incurred for the sins of God's people would be paid. He took God's wrath. He took the punishment, and he took our wretched, disgusting sin and willingly paid for them on the cross. And he was buried And for three days, evil thought it had won. But on the third day, Jesus Christ walked out of the grave and he came back to life. And he proved that the payment had gone through, that our debt had ultimately been paid. And then he invited us into his family to experience his presence yet again here with the Holy Spirit indwelling us in one day in the fullness of glory as we worship him forever. This Christ that Paul writes about in Colossians is glorious. And for all of us who have placed our faith in him, we have been made alive with Christ, Colossians says, when we were once dead in sin. We have been adopted when we were at one time alienated from God. And church, this is good news. And man, how true is it that we need to be reminded of this often. And because Christ is supreme, it leads us to this text today. Because Christ is supreme, we are to respond both personally and missionally. 
Paul is saying, in light of all of these things I have written to you, in light of everything I have explained about Jesus and what he did for us and who he was and what that means for us, in light of all of those things, let me give you the response and what you guys are to do now. And church, because of these truths about Christ, the goal of today is to walk out of here with greater urgency in these two things, prayer and proclamation. The two calls we're going to look at today are look up and pray and look around and proclaim. Look up and pray and look around and proclaim. To read again, we're in chapter 4 of the book of Colossians, starting in verse 2. Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I might make it known as I should. Paul starts by saying, devote devote yourselves to prayer. What does this mean? Because if you think about it, Paul Paul doesn't say, hey, just whenever you think about it, make sure you pray. He doesn't say, hey, make sure before you, before you, he doesn't say just before you go to bed, make sure you spend some time thinking about me. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. And I'm the first to admit that quickly we can become devoted to other things. I know in my life, I uh, have an addictive personality, so I can easily become addicted to a, a TV show on a streaming platform. And what I see is when, when my, my screen time goes up as I get addicted to a show, my prayer, t- prayer life trends the opposite direction. Paul here is telling us to be devoted, to be committed to prayer. And, and he, he tells us to be committed to prayer and to stay alert in it. That we would be watchful, as some translations say. Because church, the world is filled with distractions all around us. And perhaps what is most dangerous about these things is that we would lose our eternal perspective. That we would lose sight of eternal things. We forget so easily the spiritual battle that is at play around us. And we begin to believe that other things in our life are more precious than Jesus Christ. We begin to allow the gospel message to fade in its importance in our heart and allow other things to become more prominent in it. We don't always, if we're honest, view Jesus as our prize, but simply our get out of hell free card. We don't long for eternity, but we we begin to cherish earthly comfort more. You see, when Paul tells us to be devoted to prayer, to stay alert in it, to be watchful in it, he means it with urgency because there is an urgent battle at hand. Imagine with me if if Offutt Air Force Base did not have security around it in the middle of the night. Like imagine you could just drive up between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. and you could go in without any questions asked. How easily would that military base be, be taken over, right? As you guys know, maybe, maybe you guys know there is a literal bunker, like, I don't know, it's like 100 stories underground where when something happens, the president flies there and he's underground to be protected. How easily would Offutt Air Force Base be overtaken if there was no one watching in the middle of the night? And in the same way, we're supposed to be urgent and diligent and watchful in prayer, as there is a battle at hand around us because we are so easily distracted and our hearts are prone to wander. That begs the question, how do we do this? How do we actively take part in this? And Paul, I would say, answers that when he says, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. By approaching God with thanksgiving for everything he's done for us. Starting with the mystery of the gospel. One way that I've I've tried to implement this into my life in the past, in in this most recent season, is uh, I started trying to make a practice of every morning 
actually pausing while I'm driving to a meeting or when I get up in the morning and I'm laying there is to actually remind myself of the gospel. And I don't mean just say, oh, thank you for the gospel, but actually laying there and saying, God, you are holy and you are good and you created us to be in relationship with you, but we messed it up and we sinned and fell, apart, fell away from you. We could no longer be in your presence, but you sent your son Jesus to live with us, to die for us and to come back to life. And because of that, because when I was dead in my sin, you died for me. When I was dead in my sin and wanted nothing to do with you, you pursued me and saved me. Now I can be in a relationship with you. And I say, thank you, Lord. I I try to make a practice in the morning. I stole this from a Puritan who used to do this, make this practice in his life. But when when I heard that, I was like, yes, I need that. Because I am so quick to think about the next thing I need to do. I'm so quick to think about the next meeting or the next thing or whatever distraction, whatever project, whatever thing I have on my plate. And I can go through the day very easily without reminding myself of my purpose in being here. And what ultimately I have joy in or confidence in, in the gospel. So, what, so we approach God with thanksgiving for what he's done, ultimately for the gospel, but then also for the many blessings he's given us. For common grace things like getting to drink coffee or getting to enjoy food or getting to drive or whatever it is, but actually thanking God for the many blessings in our life. Because God ultimately is the gift giver, and good gifts come from our heavenly Father. Paul, he he tells the church, you guys need to stay alert in prayer with thanksgiving, and then goes, hey, also, while we're on the subject of prayer, let me throw in another little prayer request. He says, would you guys actually pray for me? And you see what's Interesting. The, the church in Colossae would understand that Paul, while he's writing this letter, was in prison. And what you would expect to see next isn't what Paul writes. You would expect to see, would you pray that I would get out of jail soon? Would you pray that these guards wouldn't torture me too badly? Would you pray that my, my life would be prolonged? Would you pray for my comfort to, to be had? Would you pray for any number of these things? But that's not what Paul asked for prayer for. Paul says, would you pray for us also that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I might make it known as I should. He prays that he would be able to proclaim the gospel as he is in chains. And that should stick out to us, church. You might ask, well, why should we pray? If God is sovereign, why should we pray that that God would save people? Well, for that exact reason, we should pray. Because it is God who saves people. Because God is ultimately the one at work. Because God is ultimately the one who is seeking and saving the lost. We should pray that God would give us opportunities to preach the gospel to those around us. That God would use us to accomplish his mission. And I would ask church, how much time do you spend praying for God to open doors in your life for gospel proclamation, for opportunities to preach the gospel and evangelize? How often do you pray that you would get to to preach the gospel to that family member who calls you a Jesus freak and, and doesn't want to hear anything about it? How often do you pray for that coworker who has a nasty attitude towards you and wants nothing to do with the fact that you're a Christian? How often do you pray for these opportunities, church? And I'd say, if I had to evaluate, much of the church in America likely doesn't pray these things because they would rather, if they are honest, and if we are honest, they would rather have someone else preach the gospel to them. Say, man, I'll invite them to church, but I don't want to be the one to preach the gospel. I want to let the person in the pulpit do it. I'll I'll, I'll be nice to them, but man, I don't want to start a potential fight, so I don't want to actually preach the gospel to them. So we, we begin to not pray that God would use us to preach the gospel because we're scared of the implications that it might bring. That God might actually answer that prayer, give you that opportunity, and then you're met with a moment of, oh, shoot, I actually got to follow through with this. 
But then on the other side of the ditch, maybe you preach the gospel often, but you don't spend much time in prayer. Maybe you go out and you're preaching the gospel and you're figuring out a way to get it into every single conversation, but you're not asking God to open the door for you. And man, this is the ditch I can often fall into. This past school year, um, so I used to do college ministry in Omaha, and this past school year, I started and and we were praying and expecting God to do some big things. And we're a few weeks into the semester and our our staff team, there's there's four of us who were on the college team. We were getting a little discouraged because we weren't getting to see much happen. We were preaching the gospel faithfully and we were evangelizing to lost students who um, we had come into contact with, but we weren't getting to see much fruit. And we were just growing discouraged until a staff meeting came and we actually were really, the Holy Spirit convicted us that we had spent more time strategizing about how to try to reach campus than we had actually spent uh, time praying that God would go forth and do it. So that meeting, man, we, we pushed pause on our plans and we wrote a list of all the non-believers that we had come into contact with that semester. Any non-believer that we knew of that our student leaders were preaching the gospel to or that we were preaching the gospel to, and we wrote a long list. And then we prayed name by name for every single one of them that God would save them. And we just begged God to move, that he would use us to advance his gospel, to advance the kingdom of God in Omaha. And as we prayed, like, okay, God, would you do this? And that next week, like, and, and God doesn't always do this, right? But that next week at PC3, we, fall, we saw four students place their faith in Jesus. We saw four students surrender their lives to Christ, and, and we continued on, and we actually had three lists going. We had a list, and we were praying for all the new Christians. We were praying for our student leaders, because they're the ones who are ultimately doing most of the ministry at our college ministry, and then we were praying for the non-Christians, and we were praying for these different lists of people, and we were praying that God would use us, and that we would see him do amazing things, and our prayer request as we went into the school year to brag on God a little bit was that we would see 30 salvations this past school year. They were like, okay, this seems like a big prayer. It seems bold, but okay, God, we'll, we'll see, and then we're driving to spring, we're, we're driving to winter retreat at the end of first semester, and at that time, we had had someone else place our faith in Jesus, and, and I was like, God, I don't know if you understood, because we're at 31 salvations at the beginning of one semester, and I thought you were going to do this in one school year. He saved 31 people first semester, and then at the end of the school year, we had 41 students place their faith in Jesus. And, and that's, not, that's not to brag on us, but literally, we got to see God do something amazing because our student leaders got it. They understood, man, it is our job to preach the gospel. It is our job to preach the gospel to these people. And we were praying and God answered in a really cool way. And that this, this year, this past year from my own walk with God, I would say this is the most I have prayed. I have been guilty of trying to do activity for God without inviting him into it. But Paul here is clear that, man, we need to invite God to move. And we need to be people who pray. And we need to look up and pray. We need to persist in prayer with thanksgiving. And we need to set our eyes on the things above and allow God to remind us of the eternal mindset we are called to have in order to pray for opportunities to preach the gospel to the lost around us and that God would move in a mighty way in their lives. But as we pray, we need to be ready to look around and proclaim. Look around and proclaim. I'm going to start again in verse 3. Paul said, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak or proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making most of the time. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Notice here that Paul doesn't say, pray, church, that God would see, that the people around us would see that we are nice and then believe in Jesus. It doesn't say, pray that the pastor at the church would preach the gospel and see my friend get saved. Paul here gives us a framework for theology that some of us might be lacking in. 
Paul wanted God to open the door for him to speak or proclaim, as it says in some translations, the mystery of Christ. God's sovereign means for reaching the lost is the preaching of the gospel. The gospel does not go forth with our actions. It goes forth with proclamation. We preach the gospel. We are called to preach the gospel and evangelize. We are to step out and tell people that they have sinned, that they deserve to go to hell forever, and that that, that is their punishment for sin. We help people understand the bad news of judgment that rests upon them apart from Christ, and we let them feel that. We, we tell them that they should feel conviction for their sin and call them to pray that they would. And when they feel the weight of that, when, when they feel the weight of their sin, we then continue preaching the gospel with joy, saying, yes, but that doesn't have to be the story. Because if you repent, you turn from the way you're living and you trust Christ, you trust his sacrifice, you bow your knee to him as Lord and Savior, he will save you. And you can spend eternal and eternity with him. And this is the message we are called to proclaim. Did you know, church, that over 90% of Christians never get to personally lead someone to Christ? Over 90% of Christians never personally get to lead someone to Christ. And that statistic is alarming. And did you also know that nine out of 10 salvations come from a personal relationship and a personal conversation, and one out of 10 comes from someone responding to the gospel being preached in the pulpit? Nine out of 10. So there's something alarming about these statistics. My theory is that these stats exist because most Christians do not preach the gospel to those around them. These stats exist because most Christians do not preach the gospel to the lost people around them. Many Christians might invite their lost friends to a missional outreach event or to church, and and they might think that that is evangelism. To church, it's not. And this is a soapbox I will gladly stand on for hours and hours. It is not evangelism just to invite someone to something. Evangelism is preaching the gospel. And it is most likely that that person will respond to the gospel from you, not from the person up here. Paul argues that the only way the gospel goes forth is through it being preached. So he asks, would you pray that God would open the door that I can preach and proclaim the mystery of Christ? And he goes on to be clear, saying our actions do matter. The way we live does matter. It, it can't, or the, way, or the way we live cannot contradict what we say we believe, but our actions are to reflect what we say we believe. So our actions do matter, but they don't ultimately save those around us. And Paul goes on here saying, would you make every, the most of every opportunity And man, I miss many opportunities because I'm so distracted by what I have going on and by things going on in my life. For me, most notably, I would say, when when I know it's about to rain and I'm trying to rush and mowing the yard and my neighbor comes outside, there, there are many times I'm like, man, I could go talk to him right now, but I'm like, I really need to get this lawn mowed because the trash is being picked up tomorrow, the rain is coming. But there are times and I actually need to just stop I need to go talk to my neighbor. But church, let us not get it messed up. That evangelism is not an event we do. It is not something we hold. It is not something to add to our life. It is not another thing to do, but it is a lifestyle we each should live. Somewhere in our culture... Some time in our history, it became a thing to believe this silly lie that says, hey, don't talk about religion or politics with your coworkers or neighbors because that's too personal and you might start a fight. And that is the dumbest thing ever for a Christian to believe. And I mean that. Because ultimately, you were sovereignly placed wherever you are. Whether, wherever you're working, wherever you go to school, wherever you live, 
You were sovereignly placed there by God. And there are lost people who live next door to you, who work next door to you, who live around you, who need you to preach the gospel to them. And it's so easy to believe this lie that when I go to work, well, there's rules about how I can do this because we walk into work thinking that our boss has ultimate authority. Or we walk in thinking the CEO has ultimate authority. Or we walk in thinking the the social norm has ultimate authority. But what Jesus says in the end of Matthew is that he has ultimate authority on heaven and on earth. That means when you go to the workplace, Jesus has authority there. More than the CEO of your company. Jesus has authority in our lives, but then also in the places that we work. Even in the places where people are not worshiping Jesus, Jesus has authority there. Because he says he does. He says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. That doesn't mean some authority. That means all authority. So that means when we as Christians go into a place, we bring the presence of God because the Holy Spirit lives within us and Jesus has authority everywhere we go. And that means we get to be the light of the world and proclaim the gospel everywhere we go because we know that Jesus has authority there. And we know that God is sovereign, so God is going to use our gospel proclamation to reach the lost. We can go in with assurance knowing that it'll happen. Maybe not every time, and maybe you personally don't get to see it, but we know that it's not going to be a waste when we go preach the gospel. This doesn't mean that we can just be jerks to those around us in the name of Jesus, but, but it means we preach the gospel boldly, seeking to make the most of every opportunity around us. And we allow our lives to reflect the words we preach. And some of you, as you hear um, the sent, you hear this part in this passage when it says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Think that that means we should not proclaim judgment and that we should not talk about hell to those around us. And you think, man, how am I going to be gracious and tell them, hey, you deserve to go to hell. And we, we think these things are opposite, but I'm saying it is unloving not to tell people. It is unloving to not tell people that they are going to go to hell when they die. There's this guy that I used to live next to named Joe. And Joe has had a crazy, crazy life. And he, he does not believe in God. Um, he, he gets drunk fairly often and, and uh, just says whatever comes to his mind. And I, I began a relationship with Joe when I was living there. And, and from the jump, said, hey, there, there are five guys moving into a house, okay? So when five guys move into a house, most people think, okay, this is about to be a party house. And, and I went over and met him and said, hey, no, actually, we're Christians. And, and I just introduced, um, introduced us. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, he had had some bad experiences with Christians. And so I was kind of working an up, uphill battle with him trying to redeem his perspective of what it meant to be a Christian. And I began a relationship with him. And I I lived next door to him. Um, I haven't lived next door to him for the last two years. But I mean, I had multiple conversations with him where I told him that he was going to go to hell when he died, if he didn't place his faith in Jesus. I told him very bluntly and very straightforward, dude, if you don't place your faith in Jesus, you will go to hell. And most people think, oh man, did, did your relationship end? No, because I care about him and I continue to invest in his life. And and you know who he calls when he finds out his brother's dying? I haven't lived next door to him for two years, but I get a call from him, even last night for 30 minutes. And he's just saying, dude, I'm messed up. I found out my brother's dying, my dad's dying, my mom might be dying, and everything in his life is, is going to crap right now. And who does he call? And I and I asked my wife, and I was like, God. Would you, and I asked her to pray, and I said, God, would you be using this somehow? Because his heart is so hard right now. And I have no clue what you're wanting to see happen. And I, I understand this might be a long game, but God, would you save this man? I feel like God has used me and the guys who have lived there to redeem his perspective of Christians. But this is, just goes to show that we can tell people that we believe they're going to go to hell, and we can continue to have a relationship with them because we care for them. Because we care about them. So to get practical for a moment, how do we live this out? 
How do we actually let our words be seasoned with salt? And how do we make the most of every opportunity? How do we preach the gospel when it never seems like they're the natural opportunity to? All right, so I have three things that I want to apply with this. Three, three practical steps for you guys. And the first one is pray. Going back to the first point, the, the first step is we pray. And, and then two more things after that. The second one, the second practical thing that you guys can add to your life is this. Stop assuming that people around you are Christians. Stop assuming people around you are Christians. When you meet someone and they say they believe in God or that they're a really nice person or that they've gone to church, stop assuming that because they say those things that that means that they are born again of the Spirit of God. This is one of the biggest things, I think, that if the church would change their mindset in, that they would actually then have a heart for that person to preach the gospel to them and God might use them to see them get saved. Now, I'm not saying we, we go in assuming that they're not a Christian, right? I'm not saying you go in assuming, hey, Ricky and Alex, I don't know if you're actually a Christian, but, but I'm saying we, when we go to meet someone, we don't start with, oh, I immediately assume you're a Christian. No, we go in neutral. Why? Because I actually believe that is the most loving thing. There's a, there's a couple in our church who um, came a year and a half ago, um, Eric and Jess Wu, and my wife and I said, okay, we're going to grab lunch with them. We met them the day after they moved to Omaha. They came to church, and we're sitting there like, oh, we, got to, we met them. They're at church, right? They must be Christians. And I'm like, nope, I'm not assuming that. And, and so Hannah and I, we, that's my wife, we, we went and grabbed lunch with them, and we went into that like, okay, I, I want to figure out where they're at with Jesus, and it became very clear very quickly as we asked them questions about their story and as we asked them where they're out with Jesus that they were actually saved. And five months later, we were explaining how we do ministry in college and how we have these things called gospel appointments where we go and meet with someone for coffee or lunch or frisbee golf or whatever it is. And, and our goal with a gospel appointment is to um, hear their story, to ask them questions and, and discern whether or not they're a Christian. And he was like, oh, really? So what does that look like? And I said, yeah, you remember that lunch we had with you like five months ago? They're like, yeah. I said, that was a gospel appointment. <laughs> and they were like, oh, well, awesome. Like they were like actually glad that someone cared enough to discern whether or not they were a Christian. Because we might be scared that, oh, what if I offend a Christian because I, I'm asking them a question to, to prove if they're saved. Like if someone comes to me and wants to evangelize to me, I'm encouraged, not discouraged. Like I am encouraged that there's other Christians who actually care about my eternal destiny that would care enough to preach the gospel to me. So church, stop assuming people around you are Christians. Stop assuming. I have met nice people who were dead in sin. I have met people who went to church their whole life and weren't saved. As I look in the mirror, I see that person. I have met people who say they believe in God but do not understand the gospel. So then you might ask, okay, but then how do we go about figuring out whether or not they are a Christian or not? That's a great question. The first thing was prayer, the first step. The second step is to stop assuming. And the third one is groundbreaking. Become a great question asker. Become a great question asker. And, and this is a good tool, not just for evangelism, but for discipleship and fellowship and, and just general life. But become a great question asker. So what does this look like? This means you take interest in people's lives around you. You ask them questions about their interests, their upbringing, their family, why they do what they do, what they're passionate about. You, you actually take time to take interest in people's lives. And then as you do, as you take genuine interest, this could be over the course of two minutes or a couple of weeks, you ask them, hey, so what do you think happens when you die? And, and that might seem like a big jump, but if you've actually taken time, literally, if this can be over a matter of minutes or a matter of weeks, it should not be a matter of years, but it, it can be literally within two minutes or three minutes after you're asking them questions, because what happens when someone is getting asked questions is they love to talk about themselves. 
Like, it, there is something when, when Christians take an interest in their life or someone takes an interest and you start asking them questions, you might be surprised at the things they reveal to you. Like, they might share something with you that they've never shared with anyone before. Like, I've had this happen on numerous occasions where they find themselves opening up more than they ever have because I simply was just asking questions. And then I get to ask them, okay, so what do you think happens when you die? And how do you get there? And then from there, I get to understand, okay, this is the framework for thinking. They, they don't believe in God, so they think nothing happens. They think, oh, there's a heaven and a hell, and if I'm a good person, I'll go to heaven, and if I'm a bad person, I'll go to hell. And I love that, I love that response, because then I'll say, okay, well, how good do you have to be? I'll say, did you grow up in church? Yes, I grew up in church. How good do you have to be? Well, better than Hitler? <laughs> And then from there, I'll, 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 I love asking this question. I'll say, what if I told you the Bible says you have to be perfect to get to heaven? They go, well, then no one's going. And I say, yeah. But what if I told you I know I'm not perfect and I know I'm going to heaven? I'm like, what? Now I've said things that seem to contradict. And then I get to preach the gospel. Church, become great question askers. It is simple. In your workplace, take time, sit down with lunch, and ask your coworker questions about their life. It's that simple. When, when you're at a child's uh, soccer game, talk to other parents and ask them about their life. I mean, your kids are an easy icebreaker. Ask them questions about their kids and their upbringing and their likes and their dislikes and their interests and what they do. Ask them if they go to church anywhere. Ask them if they have a spiritual background. Realize that God has put you in those places to be the salt and the light of the world, to be a city set on a hill to proclaim the gospel to the lost and dying people around us. If you're a stay-at-home mom, take time to get to know your neighbors or networks or groups that you're involved in and actually take an interest in people's lives. If you're an empty nester, if you have grandkids first, there's probably evangelistic opportunity there. But then beyond that, do not, I implore you, do not just coast into eternity because we need you to invest in the next generation. Take time to actually ask hard questions of the younger generations and see where they're at with Jesus. And don't assume that your friends who have gone to church maybe their whole lives, that they're actually born again either. Realize that God has placed you in those places to preach and proclaim the gospel. And if you tell me that you don't know any non-Christians, then you need to get around non-Christians. If you're in here and you don't have any non-Christians in your life that you can think of, you need to find ways to get around them. And I'm not saying you need to start going to the bars and staying there all night, but I'm saying you need to get involved somewhere, somehow. Go play pickleball. That seems to be popular. <laughs> Go do something. But get around non-Christians. Because we are called to look around and proclaim. And maybe your reason for not wanting to preach the gospel is because you're scared of what people will think of you. And to that I would respond, the primary reason you're not preaching the gospel isn't out of fear, but it's because you care more about what they think of you than you love them. It is actually a lack of love you have for them is the reason. Because you care more about yourself in that instance than you do the people around you. Maybe you're, you're worried about what you will say. And you're like, man, I just got saved two weeks ago. You go tell people the gospel. The woman at the well said, man, come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. And that's all she knew. You tell people what you know and you continue to seek the scriptures to learn and grow. If you're a young adult and you're, you're wrestling and struggling, mourning a season when you're, you're out of college, you're like, man, it's a lot harder to live missionally after college. Yeah, that might be true. But God has called you to the places you're called for a reason. If you have kids and you feel like you're drowning and you don't know how to add this to your life, first remember that your kids might not be saved, so you have a duty to evangelize and disciple them. And then start talking to your neighbors they're talking to your coworkers. Or the empty nester, again, please do not coast into eternity. We need you to preach the gospel. There's a guy named Jack Arendt at City Light Omaha who's retired and one of the most joyful people you'd ever meet. And he regularly has people over to his home at his dining room table. He likes to destroy them in Settlers of Catan and then preach the gospel. 
And he leads countless people to Christ at his dining room table of all ages. Church, evangelism is not a burden that God is calling us to do. It is a gift that he invites us into. He invites us to participate with him in reaching the world. Proclaiming the gospel is his sovereign means for saving the lost. And we know with certainty that he will save those whom he has predestined. So as we go preach the gospel, we do so with boldness, knowing, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will save those who he is predestined to. And there is no greater joy other than experiencing Jesus yourself than getting to see someone else place their faith in Jesus. There's no greater joy. So church, would you guys believe that? And would you pray that God would give you a desire to do just that? So we would look around and proclaim the gospel to the lost and dying world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you ultimately looked at us when we were running from you, wanted nothing to do with you, and, and that you saved us. God, thank you that you did not just let us sit there and go into eternity in judgment, but Lord, that you actually sent your son to die for us. And I pray for City Light South, God, would, would there be a movement in the hearts of the people at this church? Would, would there be a movement in this church to actively and actually pray for the lost around them and to proclaim the gospel to them? And God, would, would there be baptism after baptism that happens as a result of this church being actively engaged in what you've called them to? God, would your gospel go forth and would, would all glory go to you? Lord, I pray for the one who feels convicted. God, would you bring them to a place where they want to um, honor you with their life? And I pray for the one who is discouraged. Would you encourage them knowing that ultimately it is you who does the saving? And God, for the one who feels condemned, would they rest in your grace knowing that you did die for our sin of omission as well? Would they rest in your grace and love? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.